get by It resides between my eyes Walk through the fire Came out better on the other side See like like a beach If you find the same like right now I feel like a hundred grand You are listening to Inspired Insider With your host, Dr. Jeremy Wise You looked at our group and said Denver has a Super Bowl winning defense You saw it before the first game Two-point conversion coming up. The drive from a couple out from the gun. And he hits the pass to Fowler to make it 24 to 10. Dr. Jeremy Weiss here, founder of InspiredInsider.com, where I talk with inspirational entrepreneurs and leaders. Today's episode is none other than Benny Fowler. I'm going to introduce formally in a second, but... Before I do, Benny, I always like to point out what other episodes people should check out on the podcast. Um, one of my favorites is Pat Williams. Um, if people don't know Pat Williams is, he brought the Orlando Magic to Orlando. And what's interesting about him is he went door to door, Benny, selling season tickets, pre-selling season tickets before they even brought the franchise to Orlando to prove that they should bring them. So he went door to door selling season tickets, pre-selling season tickets. They didn't have a team and went back and go, listen, I sold out. I don't remember if he sold it out, but he sold a lot of season tickets. He's like, we should, we, I've already proven they want a team here. And he was famous for drafting Shaquille O'Neal and Charles Barkley. Um, check him out. Check out that episode with Pat Williams. It's he's an amazing individual. Um, I also like to tell stories that are, you know, Benny's book is Silver Spoon, which I'll mention in a second, but I like to tell stories too, Benny, that are the challenges, not just like the high points. And so some of these people we've heard of, like the founder of P90X, Tony Horton, you know, we know what he's done with P90X, but what people sometimes don't know is he drove cross country and the, he made his food and rent money by putting his hat out on the street and being a street mime. Like that's how he actually paid for his food and rent. So these just stories of people, you know, just grinding and making it happen whatever way possible. I love hearing. And so um, check out that and many more at insider.com. And this episode is brought to you by Rise25. And at Rise25, we help businesses give to and connect to their dream relationships. We do that by helping you run your podcast. And for me, Benny, I know from observing you and studying um, some of the stuff that you've put out, the number one thing in my life is relationships. I'm always looking at a way to give to my relationships profile the people, companies that I admire and shout out to the universe on what they're working on. And so I have been podcasting for over a decade. And so if someone has questions about podcasting, um, they're thinking about starting a podcast, you should. Benny has a podcast, Quiet Time. You should check it out. He has some great episodes there. Um, If you have questions, go to rise25.com or email me personally um, there. A shout out to Dan Cashel of Growth to Freedom. Um, he was also, Benny was also a uh, guest on his podcast and Dr. Rashir Sira of Resonia, the Performance Enhancer podcast. Everyone should check out both of those. And, you know, Benny, it's funny when I observe you and I've, I've watched, yeah, I don't know, dozens of videos of you talking and in your thought leadership, um, you know, you seem to be just a humble class act. Like that's how I define you as, and in case in point, I ask you for a bio. Okay. So I could read. <laughs> this is what Benny sent me. Okay. Benny Fowler is a current NFL veteran of eight years, Super Bowl champion, best selling author, author of Silver Spoon, the imperfect guide to success. He is also an executive coach. Okay. Benny, that doesn't do justice. Okay. At all to what yeah. you're about and what you have accomplished and what you do. My, my intro for you is Benny began his career as an undrafted free agent signed by the Denver Broncos after graduating from Michigan State, which did you win one Rose Bowl, two Rose Bowls? What? No, just one Rose Bowl, one two Rose Big Bowl. Ten Championships. Oh, Big Ten Championships. Okay, because I see the rings on your website. I got it. Um, he won a Super Bowl at the Denver Broncos at Super Bowl 50. From that game, he was you know, notably remembered for catching the final pass of Hall of Famer Peyton Manning. He's played with Eli Manning, Peyton Manning, Drew Brees, Tom Brady, uh, he's currently with the 49ers and, um, you know, he has spoken to organizations like Remax, YPO, EO, and, and helped some of those organizations too. So Benny, thanks for joining me. Hey, Jeremy, thank you for having me. I really appreciate it. Um, you know, I don't like to toot my own horn. So, 
but I do appreciate that intro and it's, it's, it's great to be on your show. Yeah. I mean, that's, that's what, you know, I get to toot your horn, right? But <laughs> so I forgot one of my, one of my mentors, and I don't know who came up with this quote, Brian Kurtz says, it's not bragging if it's true, I guess. I don't know. So that's, like you know, that. that's, that's what he says. So it's all of that is just factual statements about you and your accomplishments. I want, I was wondering where to start this interview off because there's so many directions we could take this. And I wanted to start off with, um, you know, that you to paint the picture, what happened? Um, Super Bowl 50, you know, um, you are, you know, that, that pass and the, you're in the huddle, you're everything, what's going on around you. So before that, because this kind of goes into the executive leadership, all that is built up with decades of you training for this moment. Right. And so walk me through what your, your, the, all the senses that are going through before you line up to catch this. Yeah. Pass. Yeah. It's just a little bit under three minutes to go. I would say in the game, you know, we just scored a touchdown. So we're up 12 points right now. Now we have a chance to go for one and kick a field goal and go up 13 or go for two, go up 14, put the game completely out of reach. So we decided to go to go for two, you know, Peyton calls the play and there's actually on NFL films, him telling me in the huddle, like, Hey, just give me some time. Just let me get the laces. I'm throwing it to you because of the, he look said that, that to knew. you. Yeah. Because of the look we knew we we're going to get down there. It was all man to man. So you can actually see in the play on the clip that he was supposed to actually motion Emmanuel Sanders down. Emmanuel Sanders is waving his hands so he can motion down. Peyton doesn't even motion him down. The ball's hiked. I take some steps toward the defender. I act like I'm, I'm going right and I break left. And then I see the ball in the air. And it's as, in, as if an infant baby is being thrown towards me. And I sure as hell better catch this thing. So I catch this ball. I, I catch it. I cradle it hold on for your dear life. And, you know, that's where my, my dreams, you know, all the possibilities in my life became a reality. Like you said, all those, that all that dedication, those decades of work to, to come to that point all came true. But, you know, that was one of the most surreal moments in my career. And my dad and my stepmom and my two sisters were actually sitting in that end zone, you know, I think about 10 rows up. So it was awesome. I get up, I do my Billy White Shoes Johnson dance, which is an old school dance. <laughs> you know, I had my hands in the air. So it was just an incredible moment. It's like, you know, I really caught a pass in the Super Bowl. But in the only pass caught that day for points. And it ended up being the last pass and final pass of now Hall of Famer Peyton Manning. <laughs> I wonder if it's legal for me to clip that into the beginning of this interview. I don't know who owns that clip. <laughs> <laughs> do you do you have that clip somewhere no i don't know you don't I, okay. yeah, I probably have it on my phone i'm gonna have to find that. it yeah you know no, people um, use, people use it i love it um i love that visualization as if an infant baby is hauled into the uh the air i could say yeah. if a baby's being talked to you 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 make sure to catch it in cradle and that's exactly how i caught that ball you know, in your coaching practice too, you talk a lot about mindset. And in that moment when he, I didn't realize he had said to you, okay, this is, I'm, I'm going to you on this. Yeah. What are you thinking there? Don't mess this up. There's a lot of pressure. <laughs> no. I mean, there's a lot of pressure. Uh, um, despite there's a lot of pressure. You know, it, I think you know. one of the things that I, I talk about when I'm working with executives and leaders is, is presence. And when, you, when you're playing with a guy like Peyton, who has such extreme poise and such extreme presence, it doesn't, you, I never felt the pressure when I was playing with him because he made the things easier. So if you're a CEO, if you're leading your company mm -hmm. and you're a small business owner, or even a, uh, a major uh, C-suite, your employees are feeding off of your presence. Mm. And I was feeding off of Peyton's presence. He wasn't frantic. He didn't feel the pressure. So neither did I. Mm. And that's what you sense his calmness a bit when in that moment, he wasn't like, Benny, don't mess this up. I'm going to throw it to you. He was really calm and collected and had the poise. So that that just basically kind of went to how you were, too. Yeah, absolutely. And when I talk to entrepreneurs about certain things, I mentioned poise. And when I mentioned poise, it's purpose, optimistic. 
intention, strategic and effective. And that's what makes, those are five characteristics that make a great leader. And great leaders, we always talk about great athletes or great leaders in business. They always have this point, this poise or this calmness where they don't seem to get rattled. And that's what Peyton, Tom Brady, Drew Brees, Eli, that's what they all possess is a certain amount of poise. They know why they're out there. They're optimistic. They see it. They have intention when they do things. They're strategic and they're effective. Yeah. They're consistent all the time. So poise is, is something that I talk about a lot with mm. my executives. So did you come up with that acronym? That's pretty good. I like that. Yes, I That's did. Yours. I okay. Did. I can yeah, see why you're friends with Dan Cashel because like <laughs> he could rattle off like acronyms like like no one I've ever uh, just, you know, been with. So I like the poise one. That's a good one. Okay. That's maybe your next book. Maybe. Yeah. yeah I was thinking poise. about, you know, effective leadership. Yeah. Poise. So despite saying that I'm thinking of this, and I'm, I'm sweating underneath this shirt, thinking about <laughs> this moment. Okay. What else is going through your head? Gratitude. The fact that I'm playing in the Super Bowl, like, you know, this is what all kids dream mm -hmm. of. This is what I had dreamed of in the backyard. This is what I had dreamed of when I was going through injuries at Michigan State. Like mm. to take this all in, like I'm playing in the Super Bowl, you know, walking out of the out of the stadium that day, walking onto the field, you know, you're seeing the Beyonce's, the Jay-Z's, the Bruno Mars, you know, these people are performing at halftime. You see all these incredible celebrities, Tom Cruise, all these people on the sidelines. It's just like, wow, like I'm really here. So it was just a, it was a, it was a gratitude moment that first of all, as a second year player, I'm on the field at the end of the game in the Super Bowl with a quarterback who's been playing for 18 years. And I probably had the least amount of experience in that huddle. I think I was the, I was the second year player. Everybody else had to be a year, at least six or seven years. In, I'm in glad the, the gratitude part was going through your mind and not that <laughs> part. Like, wait, I'm the least experienced player. You know, so it sounds like you were able to, fo you were able to channel the energy of the poise around you and that you focused on the gratitude piece, which I could see if you focus on that, as opposed to, wait, I'm the least experienced in this huddle. Why, what are they doing? No, no, I definitely yeah. wasn't thinking, you know, what yeah. are they doing? But yeah, definitely yeah. the gratitude part, yeah. you have to be thankful. And then when you're being thankful, when you can't express gratitude and be fearful at the same time. So, you know, definitely choose to express gratitude over fear. Yeah. You know, what's, what's also amazing about that is you were undrafted. Um, the moment that you were actually made the team, talk about that for a second. Yeah, that was a long time coming, I, I would say, because, you know, my first year in the NFL, I was on practice squad and really learning from Peyton Manning and Demarius Thomas, Emmanuel Sanders, Wes Welker, who's now my receivers coach in San Francisco you know, learning from these, these incredible players, my second year going into training camp, you know, I've really put in the effort and time. I had moved out to LA that off season and really put in a lot of work. I had to dedicate myself. I spent most of the money that I had earned from my practice squad year on my training going into that next year. So I didn't really give myself an option to fail. So the third game comes around and the third game is, or no, the fourth game comes around. That's where the young guys are playing majority of the snaps. You know, the veterans are getting ready for the season opener the following week. So I'm playing the entire game. I have to play this game to make the team. And I go out there and I have seven catches for 75 yards and all of that off-season work, the affirmation, the believing in myself, working on my self-confidence, working on, working on my self-image, self-esteem had really paid off. And it was and it was an incredible moment. I remember my receiver coach calling me and saying, hey, man, sorry, we're going to have to. Yeah, just kidding. And That's then, a terrible thing yeah, to do to someone. Yeah, I was like, I told him, man, don't play with me like that. Like I knew because I knew I did everything to to make the team. So I wasn't really worried about that. But the fact that he did call me and, and mess with me like that was crazy. But Gary Kubiak called me and. It was just a dream come true because as an undrafted player, it's it's hard to make the 53 man roster right out right out of the gate or right out of training camp. And I was fortunate enough to, to do that. And, you know, that's a chip that I carry on my shoulder every single day. And that's why, I'm, you know, going into my eighth year is because I understand what it takes to work and I'm always going to outwork people. One thing that strikes me, what you said, Benny, is um, 
you know, spending your money on the training and the coaches, right? Um, you know, it's funny in the business world, in the, in the sports world, we wouldn't think about not having coaches. I mean, there's a coach for the quarterback's coach, there's a wide receiver's coach, there's a defensive coach, often, you know, name it, like there's a coach yeah. for everything. In the business world, it's so important to have mentors and coaches on various aspects. I'm wondering from you, what are the type of coaches that you've used? Um, you know, it could be like a health nutrition or mindset. Talk about some of the coaches that you have utilized over the years or now. Yeah, I always have, you know, I have a couple of different trainers. I have a guy that I work with usually on just receiver work in the off season. Then I have somebody that I work with in the weight room and, and conditioning. I have a couple of different massage therapists. I have a nutritionist for my food and supplements. And then I have a mindset coach and a peak performance coach. And I'm not working with those people every single day. It's, it's, they're different, you know, maybe bi-weekly, maybe once a month, but you know, we're performing at the top level and in business coaching and mentorship is extremely important. And, you know, for me starting my business, especially while I'm playing, I've needed mentors like Dan and uh, you know, my, my father who is vice president of Ford for, you know, 10 years, 10 plus years, you, you need those mentors, you need those those coaches and it's not necessarily to tell you what to do but it's how to help you perform the receiver coach some of them you know, a lot of the coaches in the nfl i would say at least 50 percent of them have never played an nfl snap so they're not there to tell you like hey you should do it this way but hey these are the standards how are you performing they're supposed to help you perform better and that's why i wanted to get into executive and leadership coaching and that's why and that's why i've seen dramatic results with the leaders that I've been working with, it's not to tell them what to do in their business. How can you do it better? Are you just, are you just hitting the standards? Are you just hitting goals that you know you can hit? What would it be like to have a breakthrough goal? What's it like to have that presence? What's it like to have all your employees put in extra hours without you having to tell them to do it? Mm -hmm. And I think that's important. Leadership, especially in the NFL, is the most unique leadership. And that's why I want to bring that to the business world because it's 53 different businesses out there on a Sunday trying to win one game. Everybody has a different lifestyle. There are different salaries and different tiers of players. There are Hall of Fame players. There's undrafted players like myself, role players. There are starters. There are first round picks, second round picks. But how do we all come together to win this game on Sundays? And I've been a part of some great teams. And I've been a part of some bad teams. And it usually comes from the top down. And it, leadership is super important on all those teams and not just coaches, not just owners and CEOs, but the players. How are the players on different teams? So if you're in a business, how are all the creatives? Are the creatives on the same floor as, as you know, people like the analytical people? Are they getting into it? You know, usually you like to have the creatives on one floor. Like, I, you know, me being on offense, I don't expect to be in a defensive meeting. So you don't want your creatives in there with your analytical people. They just butt heads or, you know, there's not just as much energy. So those are certain things like that, that we go in and we assess and, and we look out at how are the teams communicating? How is the leadership? You know, some teams, some leaders that I worked with don't necessarily always want to do a 360 feedback assessment, but that's the most important, the feedback, the eye in the sky doesn't lie. And that's one of the things that, we use as a football term is that the film doesn't lie. So the 360 feedback assessment <laughs> won't lie. Your, your, your employees will be telling you how they perceive you and how they look at your leadership style. And then we can develop a plan from there, but I don't like to just develop a plan from what you think you need to work on. Love it. You know, I want to hear some of the lessons you've learned. You've had a lot of uh, amazing colleagues, mentors, um, and I want to start with, you know, since we were talking about Peyton Manning, there is a moment when you first were in the locker room, um, which kind of shows the leader that he, he is and was. Will you, will you talk about that for a second? Yeah. So it was, you know, my first, my first day there in April, right after the draft, we, we go there. You know, we're, the bus picks us up from the Hyatt House Hotel here in Denver. And we're walking into the the facility and you know everybody's nervous everybody's got their headphones on it's just like man like we're in, we're really in the nfl but you know walking and you're just taking in this the scenery and 
stopping by the calf, you meet the, the chefs and then, you know, go to the, the equipment room and you get fitted for your helmet, you get your jersey, shoulder pads. And then, you know, you got your box and your cleats and you're walking to your locker. And then I see my locker and I'm putting some things away in my locker and acting like I'm a little busy. And then, then he walks in from the opposite side and it's, there it is. He's, it's, it's Peyton. It's like, wow. He's, you know, he's two lockers from me, you know, because I'm, I wore 16, he wore 18. He's two lockers from me. He has two lockers. He's got like his football stuff in one locker and then he's got his khakis and polos and notebooks in the other locker. I'm like only player in there with two lockers. And he comes up to me and says, Hey man, you know, you know, welcome to the team. My name is Peyton. I'm just like, what? Yeah. I, I know exactly who you are. You're the guy from the nationwide commercials. <laughs> <laughs> and you know, you're just kidding. But the fact that he came up to me that day, it, it showed a lot to me in terms of who he was as a person. Obviously I knew who he was. Everybody knows who Peyton was. Even if, even if you really don't watch football, you just see him all over the place. So the fact that he came up to me and he treated me normal and he, like he was normal, like, you know, and that, and then he made me feel a part of the team. Like glad to have you here. Can't wait to work with you. Made me want to run through a wall for this guy. Mm. And it's because of that type of leadership, him being authentic, him being personable, him having that presence that I talked about earlier. I just think it's so important. And it's, I think it's one of the reasons why, who knows that I could have caught his last pass, you know, just made that little moment right there. And the extra work that I put in to learn his playbook, learn his signals, learn his codes to understand him better. So I could be in the right spot to catch passage from him that was one of the most incredible moments him coming up to me that day with his khaki little khaki shorts on and his golf polo <laughs> it makes it um it sets the tone for culture you know um when a leader like that comes in in a humble way right and uh same thing in business right um if there's a ceo executive that you're working with you know doing the same thing i mean it's really translates across business also there's a, there's another one, you know, I know your dad is a, a big, you know, mentor for you. Um, there's, there's a, a point where, um, talk about your dad and then how Ben Wallace, uh, factors in to a lesson your dad taught you. How Ben Wallace? Mm -hmm. does? Yeah. Do you know what I'm talking about? Uh -uh. Um, there was, um, where he took you around and I think he showed you Ben Wallace's house or something like that. Oh yeah. And he showed, yeah, he said that, um, you know, you don't have to be an athlete to make a million dollars. We live on the same street. Yeah. Yeah. My dad is just, my dad has always laid the foundation and he's definitely, I, I wouldn't say a, a mentor, but he's just an example of what I want to be as a man and who I want to be. And just, you know, growing up in his house, and in, in being around him all the time, he just set the example to me, my brother, my sisters on what the definition of hard work is. You know, my dad used to take my brother and I to work when he was just a plant manager at Ford, take us to work on Saturdays, you know, just for a couple hours. And, you know, we drive around the plant and seeing the cars actually being made on the assembly line at, at Ford Motor Company. And then to see him rise to the vice president of Ford, CEO of Jaguar and Land Rover to see that evolution of business, especially as a, as a black man in, in this world was incredible, but yeah, he, he did put us in, he get, you know, we got into the car and then drove around the corner and we saw Ben out there who is also a mentor of mine in terms of sports who I actually just talked to yesterday. You know, we rode by his house and he, he did, he wanted to, he wanted to stress the importance of education and that you don't have to be an athlete to make a million dollars in that you don't have to be an athlete to live like that. And I think that's, that holds true to this, to this day, you know, some of the most wealthy people that I know are not athletes. So I want that would, that's a lesson for the kids, especially who pick up my book and for the kids in college, like, you know, yes, making it to their pros. Yes. That's something you want to do. But if you have other dreams, other aspirations, especially if you're going after money and, you know, money does bring a lot of things, especially like freedom that you don't have to just go and do it through sports. Sports is just another vehicle and a tool to do that. But there are so many different ways And being an entrepreneur, working at a different company, getting your education for whatever school you go to, go to Michigan State. But, you know, yeah, exactly. I think there's so many different, so many different ways that you can earn a living.
what was you know he he showed you that and kind of taught you that lesson your dream as a as a kid mm -hmm. right was i would to, say not even not even a kid that still is my dream <laughs> <laughs> to be in the nba yes yes still is my dream i wear nba socks in every nfl game i've ever played in <laughs> every nfl practice i've ever i've ever practiced in nba socks you know i just i wanted to be like kobe bryant i wanted to be like the late great kobe bryant he was my favorite athlete and just the way he went about things his charisma his mindset i just love the fact that he would shoot the ball with two people three people on him but he had no fear of of anything and that's what it seemed like and that's something that i've always admired about a kobe bryant and you know i had all his shoes from adidas to the nike shoes kobe bryant is is one of the reasons why I want to be an NBA basketball player. Mm. Yeah, I want to talk about, you know, that dream at some point. It never went away, but you also then had another dream, right, which is football. But who was who is a favorite um, Detroit basketball player that you looked up to or, or liked? You know, Ben, I was always around Ben. Ben Wallace, I was always around Sheed, Rip, and Chauncey, but, you know, Joe Dumars is, you know, I was really great friends with his son, you know, great friends with his son, Jordan, so I was always in the in the Dumars household who was a, was a bad boy in, in, in the bad boy airs and played against Mike, and to watch him go about his business as an executive for the Pistons, but also didn't get to see the highlights, but didn't get to see who he was as a man was was awesome and and being in Jody's house and seeing the way that you know professional athletes live that's where I got the real taste of what professional athletes got to live like see what their life was like he brought the pistons around us and I got a chance to be around those guys especially at an impressionable age such as high school they was such an awesome thing to see so you know being in his household was also uh, also great at the same time in high school is he still with the Pistons? Jody? Yeah. No, he's with uh, Sacramento. Oh, Sacramento, okay. So he does, yeah, he's in the front office at in yeah. the Sacramento Kings. Yeah. yeah, I mean, me being from Chicago, there were many years where there was a big, you know, <laughs> we couldn't beat the Pistons for right. many years, mm -hmm. you know? Yeah, so. Jody was on those teams. <laughs> he was. Yeah. The last dance, yeah. yeah. Um, so, football. Um, what, what I find interesting about your story too benny is that oh benny was probably playing football and he never stopped playing football he was playing from when he was a kid all the way up but you didn't play until junior year i played so, two years i played little league well you played little years. league but you didn't yeah. play in high school you didn't play until junior year right yeah no i didn't yeah. i wanted to be I, I was all focused on basketball i was doing some track that was my second sport so you're required to play two sports at our high school Hmm. And I was doing basketball and I was doing track and, you know, football wasn't even, even crossing my mind. What changed junior year? You know, I had a friend, some friends, Jonas Gray, Kenny Demons, two highly recruited, the most highly recruited probably athletes, football athletes in probably our school's history. You know, Jonas went to Notre Dame and played running back. Kenny Demons was a five-star linebacker that played at the University of Michigan. So those two guys, you know, we had some good, we had some good talent. They're like, man, come out for the team, come out mm -hmm. for the team. We can use your speed. You know, don't they worry about it. They saw what you were hit. doing on the track field in the basketball court and they wanted you to play. Yeah, they wanted me to play, but they couldn't convince me. So I told my mom one day and my mom was like, yeah, you should, you should go out there and play. And I was like, what? And I was like, how many moms are out there encouraging their sons to go out and play a game where their son gets hit? And I mean, hit hard. But, you know, sometimes in life, that's what happens. People give you a different perspective. And my mom gave me a different perspective, but she had the confidence in me, which ultimately led to me having confidence on the field. And I went out there my junior year and played a little bit. Then I broke my collarbone and I was super upset with my mom. And I was like, this is why I didn't want to play. <laughs> this is exactly why I didn't want to play. Six weeks after that, it heals up. Semi-final game, we run a hook and ladder play and I score the game winning touchdown to go to the state championship. And that led to 
some colleges coming after me. And then I went to some college camps and then I got scholarships to, you know, Eastern Michigan was the first scholarship offer I got after the Oakland County track meet. I ran a sub 1100 meters and they offered me. Then I went to Toledo, their camp and got an offer. Then I got an offer from Michigan State, then Indiana. And then it was like, okay, like I can really go to college for this. I'm going to college for free. Uh, went to up to the University of Michigan to visit and didn't didn't really like it, didn't drive well, committed to Michigan State the next day. Were you worried about your basketball career? Is that why one of the reasons you didn't want to go play football? Getting injured for basketball? I wasn't worried about that and no. getting injured. It was just that. I wanted to pour my time into basketball. Yeah. And that's what a lot of my friends were doing. My, a lot of my friends, my, even my brother, you know, he was a, a basketball player. So it was just like, that's what I want to do. And then when you're done, your favorite athlete playing basketball, that's what you want to do too. I wasn't really watching football games like that. I mean, you know, my dad would take us to Lions games, but I wasn't really paying attention to the players, so to speak. Mm. And um, lessons from your brother. Because your brother had some early on um, injuries he had to overcome. Yeah, my brother is one of the most incredible humans I've ever come across. That's the reason why I dedicated my book to him. You know, my brother, my brother's my hero. You know, he tore his ACL when he think he was 11 years old for the first time. And it's, it's almost impossible to tear your ACL when you're 11 years old. But, you know, a freak accident like that. But, you know, he really taught me. About what happened? Person. Just football, football practice. Oh, it was football. Tackled. He got yeah. injured in football. Yeah. Oh, my just God. Got just got tackled the wrong way. It's probably one of the reasons why I wanted to I, Really? Too. Yeah, exactly. But, you know, he just got tackled the wrong way. But he taught me about perseverance, going through adversity, never giving up. And to see him go through those injuries at such a young age and to fight back and to tear his ACL two more times after that mm. and still earn a scholarship to Central Michigan become a three-time captain, lead them to a MAC championship, and then also go to play overseas. It's just one of the most incredible things that I've gotten to witness, you know, as we've grown together. And now he's going to be, you know, leading young men as, as he is as, as a coach at Northern Arizona University right now. And Flagstaff, he just, he's just one of the most incredible people. And he just never gave up his mindset. He helped me develop my mindset in terms of being stronger, in terms of putting in the work, because I've always had a natural talent and a natural ability about him. He's had to work and overcome so many different things. He really taught me the importance of working and working with detail, working with intent, working with focus. Why did you call it Silver Spoon? Because I'm from the suburbs of, of Detroit, Michigan, and, and I grew up in Bloomfield Hills, I grew up in, in a great home. I had great family around me. And then, you know, on podcasts, like you said, there's, there, you know, we talk about a lot of failures in athletes on ESPN, ABC, whatever these athletes, you know, whatever these sporting events are, it's always, it's always a, a crazy story about somebody coming from poverty to uh, uh, achieve this height in their sport. Well, I didn't come from poverty, but I still had to work and I still had to earn the scholarship. I still had to, I still went undrafted. Like none of that mattered. I still had to put in the countless amount of hours. Like it's, it's still the 1%, but that story never gets told. So silver spoon, you know, people think that everything was given. People think that everything is given to you just because of kind of the way you grew up or if you grow up with, you know, your parents in your life, or if you grow up with, you know, in a, in a nice home that, everything's given to you. And that's not the way I grew up at all. And I want people to understand that. And that's why I put different people in, in throughout my book who have different stories, who didn't grow up like me, but have the same principles as me in terms of working hard, discipline, goal setting, handling adversity, handling success, being yourself, surrounding yourself with the right people. So that's why I called it Silver Spoon. Yeah. And I know another colleague, friend, mentor, I love to hear a lesson from uh, Dream on Green. Mm -hmm. yeah, what, really what have you learned from him? I've learned, I learned so much from Draymond in terms of being authentic, number one. I mean, he's always going to speak his mind. But when he's talking, he knows exactly what he's talking about. 
he's researching, he's doing the research. So him being authentic, but just, just his work ethic. He was, he's just a, he's a great friend. He's a, he's somebody that you need in terms of telling the truth. You know, he's not going to sugarcoat anything. And if you're looking for, you know, things to be sugarcoated or things to be looked over, passed over, well, then he, you know, that's not the friend that you want to bring around. And sometimes, you know, oh man, like Draymond's going to bring this up. And <laughs> if you kind of, you, you need that friend. That's what good friendship is all about. Right. You know, it's about being there and supporting, but also you said, this is your goal. So I'm going to hold you accountable to your goal. How did you meet? We met playing AAU. So we met playing for the family, but we also met through Jordan Dumars, who the son of, of Joe Dumars. We met at through through him, and then we all played on the same AAU basketball travel team. And then Draymond and I both went up to Michigan State, and that's when we really became really, really good friends and really close. And, you know, we've been friends and close ever since. Do you still practice basketball-wise? Oh, yeah. I still you go do. shoot around. Oh, yeah. I love. I'm always going to love the sport, but – you know, being around him, being around my brother, especially when I'm always around my brother, you know, we'll always shoot around. If I can go to the gym at Northern Arizona, like, hey, man, let's go to the gym. Let's, I want to go get some shots up or I want to go shoot the ball a little bit. You know, he's like, man, let that go. I'm like, I'll never let it go. So, no, my brother and I always go to the gym and we're always we're always playing. Um, you've played with some amazing quarterbacks. Obviously, you mentioned Peyton Manning. Um, I love to hear a few lessons from because you played with Tom Brady, Eli Manning, and Drew Brees. And, and what was really interesting, too, is um, that Drew Brees, when the Saints were looking at you, um, vouched for you. What did, he, what did he say about you? He just knew I was going to – the way I went about the game. He knew my work ethic. You don't, you don't get to my position in the NFL, especially as an undrafted guy, without doing the dirty work and doing things the right way all the time. So. That's what he saw. So he came out here during the pandemic last year to work out with Emmanuel Sanders. They had just signed Emmanuel Sanders, who was a teammate of mine for four years in Denver. So he came out here to work out with Emmanuel. Emmanuel was like, hey, just, you know, we need, we need an extra body just to catch some, some extra balls. You know, I don't want to just be running out here by myself. So I was like, okay, I'll come by. And it's like, I'll get a chance to catch Drew. And I was like, if I impress Drew, he'll easily call. He has enough pull to call, you know, the coaches and them in the staff so we get about three routes in and drew's like man who are you with right now it's like i'm a free agent because everything's kind of shut down because the world is shut down and he's like oh, i'm calling i'm gonna call mickey and sean right after this and yeah i'm like okay we'll see and then he really did and you know my agent called me he's like man drew you whatever you did whatever you impressed drew with in terms of your route running you did it like you know they, they want to bring you in at first they were gonna you know work me out and, and see but then they just they just kind of signed me based off of off of Drew Brees and, and what he said. And I think that just is a testament to me always being ready. Yeah. And, you know, I really, I really appreciated that. It's just, you never know who's watching. My mom always says that you never know who's, who's watching. And that was an opportunity. I could have easily said, nah, you know, I don't want to go out there, you know, it's a pandemic right now, but you know, when opportunity knocks, it's too late to prepare. Yeah. Some random, you know, opportunity you just seize it what did he see benny in the route running in that short period of time what was he seeing that he's like oh wow what this is i gotta make a call i would say the crisp crispness of the routes you know you know just meeting him and maybe me being a bigger guy getting in and out of my breaks i would say but then also the way i talk about the game and, you know, I can still recall some of the plays and concepts of, of Peyton. And he had mentioned a couple of concepts, you know, that he and, you know, that he learned from Peyton and things like that. And I could still put the names to him and, hey, you know, the hot's off this. And then he was like, oh, you're on it. He's a student of the so, game. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, so yeah. he could see that I, you know, conceptually understand what needs to go on, what needs to take place within a play on an offense, how to and just how to be a pro. That's. One of the things, you know, even when I got signed with San Francisco this year, you know, they said, you, you know, you're a guy that we would never have to worry about. You just, you know how to be a pro and they, you know, you, you have to come in here and set an example. And 
I think that my name carries weight in the NFL in terms of doing that, especially being yeah. undrafted. Like I'm always going to harp on that because undrafted players don't make it to eight years. I mean, you know, you have your unicorns like a, like a Wes Welker or a Rod Smith who play, you know, 12, 14 years, but you know, there's something that I have to be doing right all the time to, to play this long. Yeah, there's something to be said about having people on or in an organization and in the locker room, just like true teammates that are going to set an example, mentor, show, you know, lead by example and having those people. We've all been on teams that have those people that it's like there's this, um, you know, this just unsaid leadership about just doing what needs to be done. Right. Um <laughs> So yeah, I, what did you learn? Um, are there any list, le, other lessons you know from Drew Brees, just from being yeah, teammates? I would say, yeah, I would say his preparation is second to none. You know, his preparation is is some of the most incredible work that I've ever seen. You know, even on a Saturday before the game, you know, we're playing on Sunday. He will start at the one yard line in the indoor facility when everybody leaves and he will go through to every, you know, down a hundred yards in terms of every yard, he'll do a new play and just go through the motions of the play and see where everybody's supposed to be and visualize each play and completing each pass. I mean, it's just, you know, that, and I think that's just incredible in the way he went about his work and just, he was on point. He was always trying to be on point. He wanted to be perfect. In, in every practice, every throw. And that's why he's the most accurate quarterback of all time. What about Tom Brady? What did you, what did fierce you see competitor. lessons? Yeah. Yeah. He's just a fierce competitor, even one-on-ones. He's, he wants to compete in anything and everything. And I was only there for, you know, a short time, you know, only one week because they traded for somebody else. And then that's when I signed with New York, you know, but you know, what I saw in that week, showed me who exactly who he was for the last, you know, 19, 20 years, a competitor taking care of his body and his attention to detail. Um, what about Eli Manning? Because you play with Peyton, right? <laughs> and yeah. now you're playing with Eli. Yeah, he just, Eli set the example. Eli set an example, but he also showed the importance of teammates and camaraderie. He was, he was one of those guys, just like Peyton, like I mentioned about Peyton, he treated everybody the same. And, you know, you would see he had lunch with everybody and, you know, Eli's one of the most incredible storytellers, but he's an incredible worker. I mean, he works incredibly hard. I mean, he's staying after practice and he's helping nurture guys. I and mean, he nurtured Daniel Jones in my last year in New York. But, you know, I, I, I give him a lot of credit, even for a lot of success that Odell Beckham had early in his career. You know, Odell's first 500 catches in the league all came from Eli. So that's an, a testament to quarterback and receiver play. I want to talk, you know, uh, Benny, about the methodology. Um, when you go into an organization and talk about where you start and some of the things that you do with an organization, how you assess and, and um, kind of set goals with them. Yeah, if I'm working with leaders, it starts with a 360 assessment, assessment. And I want to talk to 10 of the 12 closest people. And even if you are, if you have enough strength, then I would love to ask your spouse as well and add your spouse. If you have enough strength. Yes. <laughs> if you have, if you have, an, if you have um, enough strength mentally to handle it, ask your spouse also for, you know, their first of all, I love the approach on that, Benny, because if you ask like, uh, whatever, let's say high powered CEO, if you say, do you have the strength? What are they going to say? Of course I do. So that's such a great, way of framing it to someone, right? Yeah. yeah so I exactly. love that. Yeah. Yeah, so definitely do a 360 assessment. Yeah. And if we're, if we're working on leadership and we're working on presence or productivity, you know, there's certain things, not everything is all the same. So it's everything is, is a tailor-made approach. If I'm working with teams, you know, what, what do we, what do we want to work on communication and, you know, effectiveness goals in terms of sales, marketing, you know, operations, there's so many different things, but I like to get an assessment. I always start with an assessment. You know, I started how I would start, you know, my off season program going into a season. Okay. What do I need to get better at? What do I think I need to get better at? And then what are the numbers and data telling me? 
And then we come up and construct a plan from there. And, and then we go from there. And then it's, it's coaching, it's setting up relationships to help to get better. Uh, there's, it, it's, I would say it's a different approach. I can't really say that it's a, hey, this is how we're following it. Mm-hmm. But it always, it's always going to start with that assessment. Yeah. You have to. The assessment will to- lead wherever it goes. And that will probably point to things. Like you said, if you just ask the person, that's different from asking the people in the organization because the person may say one thing and then you know there's other people are going to say other things, right? right? So, so if you know if it's just working with one person, you know we can go through like the GPS method, which is you know my online course that I created, which is goal setting plus purpose equals your success. But that's just like you know a baseline thing, and then you have the poise model where we can come up with you know where's your purpose, where's the mindset, where's the intention. How do we become strategic? How do we become effective? I think there's other things within that, within my organization and, and what I do and, and how I kind of work with people. But you know, I have all the leadership tools, team tools to, to be successful and, and actually gone to coactive and also done, done some leadership development and training. So it's not like I'm just using football terminology. I'm actually certified in all of this work. Yeah. Who are ideal people to work with you, companies or clients? I would say I, I love working with emerging leaders. I love working with C-suites. I think there's always a, a, a room to get better. The biggest room in the world is room for improvement. So like I said, I don't want to just come into an organization and say, hey, this is the method you need to adopt this. Or, hey, I don't want to just come in there and give a motivational talk and tell story. I want to implement things. and implementation takes time. So I like to challenge people like, okay, for the next month, like what, how, what is communication? What does great communication look like in this next month? And how do we know that's being performed? What is increasing? What is doubling our sales look like? Okay. Hey, we want to hit this sales number. Now, is that just a sales number that you want to hit? Because that, that'll make you feel good. But what's, what's a stretch goal to, to make everybody come, want to come to work or how do you have better talent retention? How do you keep your employees engaged? Because employees are just leaving work or, you know, everybody wants to be an entrepreneur now. So how do you keep your employees engaged? How, you know, I think there's so many different things in terms of, you know, where this could go. Yeah. Benny, last question. First of all, thank you. Thanks for sharing your knowledge, your stories. And um, before I ask, where should we point people towards online to find out more to LinkedIn? Okay. Yeah, LinkedIn is is a profile that I'm I'm always active on and I share a lot of content. I do my Monday mindset minute with Benny. I do that and then I, I share some articles on LinkedIn as well in terms of the things that I've learned on the field that can be applied in business. And I think that's where I, I see and engage with a lot of business owners. And you know, I'm working with about 14 people right now you know, right before the season. So we'll, we'll, you have a limited much, time. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So we'll pretty, uh, we'll pretty much come to a close with that in July, but you know, I, I still engage with people throughout the day or throughout the week on LinkedIn. Yeah. So I want to encourage people to check out Benny Fowler on LinkedIn. It's B E N N I E F O W L E R. Also check out silver spoon, his book, the imperfect guide to success. You know, Benny, my last question is um, mentors that we did not mention. It could be mentors in your life over the past couple of years. It could be distant mentors. It could be distant mentors, meaning like books that you just love from people that you respect. Who are some of the mentors or books that we weren't able to mention so far? One of my favorite books of all time, The Monk Who Sold His Ferrari, Think and Grow Rich, Success, The Psychology of Success by Carol Dweck. I think growth mindset is super important. Abraham Maslow, Maslow, Maslow uh, is a, I would say, a mentor that obviously, you know, he's not here anymore, but, you know, I've read a lot of his books. I've had so many different mentors in terms of in business and life. Dan, you know, shout out to Dan. He's a, he's a business mentor now. You know, my dad, one of the most incredible mentors anybody could ever have, you know, Julius Thomas, who's in my book, Draymond, who's in my book, my mother, who is, you know, my best friend and mentors me in so many different areas of life. So, you know, those are the people that I would, I would, you know, shout out and 
Demarius Thomas, Emmanuel Sanders, you know, so many great people. So those love are the it. people I would love to shout out. And then all the coaches that have helped me to this point. Yeah. First of all, Benny, thank you. Everyone check out Silver Spoon and Benny on LinkedIn, Inspired Insider, Rise 25. And thanks, everyone. Thanks, Benny. Jamie, thank you. What I got, you can't buy. It resides between my eyes. Walk through the fire, came out better on the other side. See, life's like a beach if you find the sand. And right now, I'm feeling like a hundred grand. 